So everybody, I think we'll get started. So I, it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Senaman Dornseif. I'm the director of the Foreign Policy Institute. And it's my pleasure to have everyone with us today for our event, Ukraine's Invisible Victims, War Heroes, and Second Hells, a year into the 2022 invasion. Um, what we're going to be taking a look at is that much of the war focuses on military battles along Ukraine's eastern border. Yet this research led by Foreign Policy Institute senior fellow, Dr. Stephen Schrage, focuses on something that we can't really forget about that's at the heart of this conflict and why it has inspired the world, the people of Ukraine. As virtual, rather as vital, as military battles over Ukraine's physical terrain are, the fight to protect its people, mostly women and children and refugees, is at least as critical, if not more so. Um, let's place this in context. Over the past year, there have been 9.8 million border crossings by Ukrainians over Ukraine's western border with Poland. Days after Russia's invasion a year ago, Stephen Schrage, um arrived on the ground there. And his aim was to leverage his State Department experience, as well as his international crisis experience, to volunteer and research the greatest needs of the Ukrainian refugees. On the border, he saw incredible historic efforts by the Polish people and the international community to come to the most vulnerable Ukrainians aid. He was especially struck by the role of non-governmental organizations and volunteers and the impact that they were having. Yet also, but harder to see, there were issues, things going on, people, places, events, policies that were threatening to undermine all of these efforts. Specifically, his research brought to light human trafficking and other border challenges that must be addressed to protect the women and children refugees critical to Ukraine's future. This timely research has been a team effort for the Foreign Policy Institute, and it has been inspiring to see FPI research assistants and others play such a key role in this work. As I turn this over to Dr. Shragi, I'm reminded of the FPI mandate itself, which is to develop realistic answers to international problems facing the United States and the world, focusing today on the Ukrainian people. It's also an example of the ingenuity, spirit, dedication, and intelligence of our SCI students can be mobilized as a part of our academic research to make a difference to the world. So Dr. Shwagi, the floor is yours. And I wanna start by thanking Ambassador Dornsife. I think she's exactly right that this was a team effort, but none of it could have happened without her leadership. When, you know, when I called her and said, basically, I'm jumping on a plane and gonna head straight to the Ukraine border if, if it's okay with you to try to do anything I can to help. And she was, she, her leadership and support being 100% behind it, um, as, as this has gone on, has been incredible. And again, so much of the team here, I see Lana, I see Sophia, who's done so many things, some of the people, Kayla and others that have just reached out, uh, Lydia, um, and in particular, there's some people on the ground as well. I see Matthew, I think I see, I recognize you back there. Um, it, it really wouldn't have been possible without all of this, you know, the SICE team kind of picking up the ball at this stage, and really at the earliest stages, um, when I was on the ground and we started seeing some of these things, people stepping up and saying, yeah, we've seen these things. They're not getting reported. They're not going up the chain of command and really took risk or stood out and, and did things and put in an incredible amount of work. I, particularly, there's um, four people. Um, Lee Wanick from the UK, who's, a, who's from Bath University. Uh, she did an incredible amount as this was starting out to, to really advance this. Um, Sebastian Stahovsky and Rafael Krawczyk were, were ex very successful entrepreneurs and businessmen that volunteered for the Polish Red Cross and then have devoted a lot of time to help me understand what's going on. And, and, and endless other people, particularly a lot of the Ukrainian refugees themselves who came forward 
And, you know, a lot of them wish not to be recognized for different reasons or, you know, because of what they've been through, but, but really informed this overall. So with, with that, I'll quickly go through this and hopefully have time for, for some questions and, 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 and go and, and open up to other people as well. Um, background, um, I had worked um, under Colin Powell as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Law Enforcement. So I did a lot of border security, human security around the world, including the first Afghan women's votes. We remember the painted fingers in the air, a lot of places around the world. Um, and in the region, what was called the International Law Enforcement Academy, where they trained a lot of the Polish and other regional individuals in human rights and kind of basic security groups uh, issues. Um, so when I you know, was inspired to go on the ground, you know, but Cinnamon is others, other people's encouragement. Um, I got there, this is based on raw data, pictures collected over a year, over 150 interviews, recordings, and, and we're reviewing data for a final report in the next week or so for the anniversary of kind of when we went out there and when the, the report was built up. And I can talk some more about that as well. Um, overview, I mean, most of you may have seen this and remember this from the beginning, but, um, when you look at where people went, these are from the you know, March 22nd, overwhelmingly, it was through Poland. That was the escape route. That was the lifeline. That was where people were able to go. And um, when you look at that specifically, um, it's this area that you may have heard of. You, you may have seen it on TV. It's kind of Medica, where's where you saw a lot of the CNN and other anchors from around the world broadcasting. Um, then there's two little towns, a town called Shijeni on this side and then uh, Shemish on the other side where, where the bulk of that activity happened. And you have to praise, as our U.S. ambassador has, the military was incredibly ready to deploy. Um, literally, when I got there, which was like seven, eight days in, you could see them moving out. You could see them in place. Um, you could see them on, on the ground and operating there. Um, it was almost nonstop. And they took over an area right outside the Zhezhov Airport, which is about an hour and 15 minutes outside the border. It's an old sports arena. But there were literally um, army officers, you know, army enlisted men camping out in there like they were out in the middle of the uh, desert somewhere, but setting up tents inside the sports arena and, and really turned on a dime. And, they, and again, it was somewhat away. Zhezhov is about an hour and 15 minutes from the main area. But it was probably the closest major base or major facility we had there. And they set up something that was, was incredibly helpful, too. They did what was called uh, the COI, Community of Interest. And they would have meetings that would coordinate early on. Um, with, as you can see from that slide, it was the Polish people, Polish agencies, EU agencies, NATO agencies. It was literally almost a cast of hundreds, if not thousands, that would be at these events. But they would pull people together to discuss these different issues give updates on the traffic flow, what was going on at the border, um, border entry point data that's been very helpful for different things. And you can see how the things changed over time. Of course, obviously March was a, was a huge surge in April, but over time there were also other spikes that happened later, including June. And uh, this is from Chen, who's one of our RAs at uh, FBI, has put together some of the data that we have available from the military in terms of overviews. And you can see again, this area of Medica, was both by far the largest entry and exit point, but it's also very critical because it was the main land transit point. During the normal situations, the only place where the most desperate people without car access or vehicles could cross by foot into Poland. That changed, they, they kind of did ad hoc ones up and down the other seven border points, but that, that again was the main lifeline. Um, humanitarian response, again, that's you've probably seen that picture on CNN and everything from the early days, nonstop. Um, were really, people were heroic, but first of all, the Ukrainian people, you would see the spirit of the women and children that had came there, mostly unaccompanied, and what they'd gone through, and just the joy once they made it across. That, that's Wojciech, he was a, another tech entrepreneur from Poland who set up what was just this incredibly impressive camp, because on the other side of Ukraine, in the early days, you had people waiting 24, 48 hours in bitter cold and actually some people dropping uh, injured or even dead at that point. And that he deployed out there and set up this amazing camp um, just as a testament to some of the things that happened. Some of the, like the Polish different organizations of scouts, that po the Polish humanitarian action. Um, there were even veterinarians that came from all over Europe. So you'd be surprised how many people came with their dogs and cats um, and they were ready to go. World Central Kitchen in DC, I think deserves a huge shout out for that. Jose Andreas's group was just incredible and was really in, in ways you see later, it was like a, a tent pole pillar 
that enabled so many other things to go because they would were supplying that food for free and enabled a lot of both the humanitarian acts as others. Um, you know, again, there's just people all over. That's Gem, which is a group out of Miami that ran like this. It was a, one of the most high tech, um, you know, transit areas for food and warehouses I'd ever seen. They would get things even like away bags and, and just move that through into Ukraine, including sometimes with armed individuals that would take them into hospital zones. But the, there's a flip side of the humanitarian response too. And this is where kind of, kind of from my background, you could start seeing some concerns was that it was chaos too. Um, just because of the features of what you saw, you had these mad dashes of people going. You had a, a, a people that you really didn't know their back. People in you know in costumes, mini suits, leopard suits. Um, this was a guy that was hanging around, speaking in broken English, with like it looked like a 1980 Ralph Lauren sweatshirt and a in a French flag, and it looked like a George Washington hat, handing out candy to kids. This was somebody that claimed to be French Foreign Legion handing out candy to kids, but he wouldn't say where he was from or provide any IDs. Um, you had right across the border, that was the Legion sign-up point. So when you walked across, you had this, it was basically a bed sheet with blood red Legion spray painted on it where they were signing up people. And in addition to people that were kind of a questionable character on that side, you also had what they would call the cowboys which were people that came out there for military purposes. This guy kind of resembled Daniel Craig, but I don't believe it was actually him. Um, and, uh, and, and people would show up. You also had some uh, very strange entities too. Has anyone ever heard of the federal Re new Federal Republic of China? It was the biggest tent there and probably the most in in imposing presence. They actually set up like an airport light arrival and departure thing there. It's a Chinese separatist group that supports overthrow of the Chinese government with links to Steve Bannon um, of Trump fame. So that shows you how chaotic and kind of unstructured this was uh, with what was going on. And obviously there were huge concerns about that, about who was accessing the refugees, what the purposes of people were there. Um, but everyone recognized it right off the bat. This guy was, was very impressive, Mohammed Rafat. He landed about the same time I did. I kind of helped him do a site survey. He was like, off record, this risk being a disaster. We need to do all these things. We need to take control of it. Um, he interviewed Nora, Nora Donna interviewed him while I was there. And you know, he said there's been a trafficking arrest. We've got to, we've got to focus on. So I, I you know, when I when I was you know, we, the mayor, there was the State Department visiting for a brief visit. UN had said one refugee, one child becoming a refugee every second. So uh, Polish Red Cross was very interested in how we take over these things. So when I left initially, the Global Gambit, which is an FBI sponsored um, podcast and event that they do online, I was, you know, kind of shaken by it all and deeply concerned, but my belief was that everyone recognized these issues. They were pretty obvious. It was just a question of, of the early stages, getting it, getting it on track. Um, and that's where it became a little bit more disturbing. These are, again, people waiting in line, but these are the eight border crossing points. They call it seven, but they call one seven A. Um, the real thing, and you heard a lot of this early on, um, but it, it died down, which was that there was this historic human trafficking security risk. And for a number of reasons, it's really still of unknown scope. You had unprecedented numbers of unaccompanied women and children coming across, disabled coming across at any point since World War II, maybe even higher in terms of the number that were coming across without, without uh, counterparts or security. We had multiple confirmed criminals that have been there, you know, pedophile, rapists, sex assault, as, especially as volunteer drivers. People would just come up and hold up signs, grab people and go off. And you know, in the early days, that was understandable, but we can, we can tell you how this per perpetuated for a very long period of time. Multiple suspects uh, are on the ground at Medicare putting bands of eight to 12 women. They would stop them. If they would get the police to stop them, the police would turn them away and then they would come back. Um, there were things of teens of men scouting openly at the border. Um, 12 year old or, or 13 year old also wrestled, fought, wrestled from traffickers at the border. Um, volunteer group actually, because no one was doing anything, formed their own kind of quasi group to patrol around, but they ordered them to stop at one point. Um, uh, police re um, reduced uh, anti trafficking was not their job. The police, again, were, were dealing with a massive amount of issues, but Reportedly, and again, in these over 100 interviews, it's again and again and again, 
the police that were coming locally from, you know, coming from other jurisdictions there or locally would say, our job is to manage the traffic flow of cars and trucks, not to intervene in these kind of situations. Um, another thing, I, I don't know if I'll mention it again, so I wanted to highlight here is the evolution of this too, as it came up with something we kind of call catfish traffic. There were a lot of people that were reaching out to people through Facebook, through Instagram and other things and arranging rides there. And we'll have case studies that, that deal with that as well too. So the bottom line, there was an, uh, up north, there's a man bra bra who bragged to, to uh, volunteers of keeping 10 to 20 something gaunt women and was stealing aid. And again, reported in, in very little action on some of these. So there was historically un unaccompanied women in child surge and limited efforts to impede measure the scope of the risk of the crisis. Um, and we'll talk, so this is an example, like for example, I zoomed in on this picture. This is a picture probably gonna be the cover of the report. That's one of the people you would see kind of along the sidelines, you know, openly with hoods over scouting people and you would refer them over to the police and they'd say, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, at least for many reports. I don't know if that's always the case, but at least in, the, in many of the reports we have done. Um, quotes, and I mean, I could go on forever. Um, got her contact number so she would arrive safely. She contacts at two o'clock in the morning. She's like, hey, we stopped in the middle road. Someone just paid our driver and we're traveling the other direction. So she sent her coordinates and locations. They took her to an abandoned warehouse in Poland. They had film cameras set up. There's a bus for over 35 people. The police got there just in time to save 35 people. It was a German driver. Um, absolutely saw a case here, a girl 12 in tears, pulled her out of, out of the uh, arms of someone that was trying to take her. Someone, it's a similar situation the traffickers have taken a passport. Um, you know, main organizer said, I've got a problem. Um, you know, this is where they had the guys that they were sending around. Um, they kept on seeing car vans. Um, you know, another one, so without a doubt, there are many occasions where see trafficking going on, we brought the police attention. They go challenge them and you don't see anything else happen. Again, I don't want to keep going on and on. Big Land Rovers and Mercedes stopped on the other side um, where they would pick up people and transit them across. Um, again, uh, th this is another van. There's, there's a lot of different van issues. Um, used to have police in the Moral National Guard. This is like two to three months in. They left. There's absolutely tra tra traffic. I'm 100% certain of that. I've seen it. There's one time where there's two guys in a van. Um, you know, so there's just so many of that with so much of that going on at this point, which is ironically the point that the press was focusing the most on that people were visiting that they were highlighting that they were looking at. So there was a concern at that point that I was like, well, what are the other border crossings like? And while I couldn't do as in depth of a visit or trips to those, I made at least two trips to each of them. And the, and the better news was that, you know, while I can't verify them to the same degree that I did at the major transit point, the situation seemed much better and that was more open. There were police there. There was, in, in some cases, there was screening of people more uh, intensely, running them through police databases, which is often not the case. So there was one in North that I, I mentioned briefly about the man that claimed to be taking One of the more shocking ones, but it was less, at least in, in, indicative of what I saw from the other sites than what I saw. Um, and when you look at it, what happens is, is this is the, the Shaheni part where you would see like the, the Teslas and the G wagons and everybody waiting, and where early on there was this huge line of people that were waiting to get in there and really in, in desperate shape. Once you got across the main part here, there was, you, you cross this border and this was just basically an open field. And if, if we, and if you could walk off there, you know, even though there was limited police here, there was definitely no police there. You could just walk off. And then once you got to that point, you could drive anywhere in Europe basically um, because of the open borders and the open situation. Um, and we just, and so Medica, this is like, we showed, again, you'd come out this border, you could walk off straight there if you didn't want to even go into town. Um, and so we decided when we started raising these, this is what we test it. We do things like a stress test or what they call in hospitals as a code pink to see if you could walk off with a child, if someone would stop you. So you basically got the entry point right there at the entry, at the entry point. And then once you get to this road, you can drive off. Anyway. We ran that test again and again and again and again. Um, and we had women simulating bringing a child off. Um, we had press that covered us. We were never stopped. Um, I was stopped once in town and just when I was sitting around. 
again, we, we tried it in different situations. We did it, I did it about two weeks ago at the main event. Offered to show to bring up different people as I show that, you know, maybe it's, it's it, as you can tell, we'll talk a little bit more. It's really hard to catch trafficking cases for a whole number of different reasons. But this is a way to show that the, uh, the availability was there and that the Um, case study one, this was in March. Uh, actually, one of the people that I work closely with knew this person. Um, he was hanging out with the rest of the, uh, the volunteers. Um, he had a van. Um, he started doing some strange things, like trying to get a 10 year old to be transited to Ukraine. Um, eventually, he went away and he had like a very loose medical uh, kit that didn't seem like he represented himself as a medic. Once he got back to the UK, they determined he was a convicted pedophile who was also kind of bragging about what he was doing. Um, and this and this happened in March. It was covered in Daily Mail, probably the most read British paper. So, you know, again, the signal was out there. This was, if anything, was like a warning sign. This, you would think, would have woken it up that you had to do basically. This is one I personally witnessed. Um, we were going back to the Shigeni side where there's these massive lines. Um, there was a woman that approached us who had every advantage you could imagine. She was coming from the Donbass. She was an interpreter, spoke fantastic English, very well educated with her mom and her aunts had just made the trip. And, she's, and she was still like, I don't know where to go. I've heard there's this place, there's a place called the Tesco that was where the main reception point. What do I do? Where do I go? And luckily we, we were there and I knew some of the human security risks, but there are people there that were lead uh, people from the entire camp, lead people from the reception point of the Tesco. So they gave her all the information. Um, we went to go see some other points and then came back out on the other side and saw her at the other end. And this is almost like a somewhat of a case study of what you would see with some of the, uh, the catfish trafficking or how people are kind of groomed to do these different things. Um, she said, well, no, we've got it all sorted now. There's a group from the Italian Red Cross that's going to take us to the town they said that somewhere there and they're going to get my mom and I jobs and everything's going to be going to be great. Really excited about it. And so one of my friends that was there, she called up her friends in the Italian Red Cross. They never heard of these people. So we're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to wait, you know, we're, we're going to wait with you. We're going to check on the other side. Um, we got them. It was a, a Russian spoken woman that uh, Russian speaking woman was it from Ukraine that was going to meet with them. Italy. Um, so we met them there, and again, the van they were taking was all women and children that, that, that they were taking to these villas uh, off into Italy. Um, so we took their information, um, and, you know, I took pictures of them. They, they were not Italian Red Cross. They had like a, a small um, badge from an NGO that was founded in the wake of the Chernobyl incident. Um, so we got all the information, and, and you would think, again, that, that everything had gone possibly right. So I drove back, and this is at the end of one of them. And I get to, um, I, I stop to get some food and I get a call from the guy says, well, you know, um, the ILM official, which is the UN official supposedly responsible for trafficking, talked to the police, but the police guy was asleep and he said, don't worry about it. So they let him go. And we were like, what? You know, we, we, we flagged this so much, but it got worse. Then they started trying to call her cell phone and her cell phone never picked up. Then they heard from her a day later but she was on the suspected trafficker cell phone. Said, oh yeah, they're taking us to the police. I have reports now through some people that she did. Now, but even if this did turn out, despite all the red lights blinking to be a great case, it shows that even in a case we had people that were specifically focused on these issues. It all broke down. And there are stories, again, that, that, are, that are far exceed this, but this is one that I personally saw. So, so I feel very comfortable with that. So uh, that's Lee Wannick, who we partnered with. And I went back in um, late March, early April. And um, it was around the time of uh, Orthodox Easter. And uh, we were talking to Good Morning Britain, which is like one of the top two or three morning shows. Um, and while we were there, there's a strange individual in a bunny um, going up and grabbing children. The children would kind of pull back. Um, he would take off his hat and he would have three pieces 
hair looked like he hadn't showered in a while, white and black streaked hair. Um, so we so we saw him, and uh, and uh, and so I walked away. We were with CNN, one of the CNN international groups. I was interviewing them. They wanted me to walk off to the other side. Oh, am I? Oh, Jesus, am I? Can, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll talk louder. Um, so while I was walking away, Lee was there by herself, and this individual got up and got in her face. And he was like about six two, kind of a big guy, maybe six foot. Um, he's like, what are you doing? Why are you asking about traffic? You should not be here asking about traffic. You should be, you should be helping the kids. You should be doing stuff directly and swore at her and said some other things. I came back and the guy hightailed off and he actually ran to the Chinese separatist tent. Um, and I followed him and I sat down with him and just, in the, you know, I recorded an interview. I said, Hey, I just want to know what you're doing out here. What's going on. Um, again, it seemed very strange. Then I came back out talked to the CNN individual and Lee, he had packed up his stuff and ran out of the site as fast as we could see. So we're going back on the way back and Lee's flying out, I'm flying out the next day. And we just said, well, we'll do a quick Google search. I had gotten the guy's name. The guy was an attorney previously in, in, in uh, Kentucky who had his license suspended and was disbarred for mental instability. Um, he's on, you can Google him right now and you can see him with these profanity laced diatribes about how he's going to attack people. Um, he was running for judge because he was so delusional. And not only that, but again, the Kentucky court ruled last week that he using either poses a substantial threat of harm to his clients or the public and that he's mentally disabled and lacks mental fitness. And this is probably worse moving for suspension in Ohio. It's disciplinary counsel said Ducey has a history of domestic violence has made multiple threatening statements towards women and one of his children, including direct statements or insinuations that he was going to kill them. So we flag this for all these people, but at least according to press reports, including embassy police, the guy that was with us from CNN was kind of shaking when he went and talked to the police who was Polish. But uh, according to at least the, the press reports from Kentucky, he was there several more weeks before he was back. Um, then, uh, and again, he was bragging about it on, the, on other things. The other, so that's on the human trafficking. The other thing where you're asking kind of what, how did this all happen and what are some of the things? One of the things was that the UN had by far the most resources and there were some people that did incredible work for the UN there. But you would also, when you would go to the UN tents, they were often empty. The people that were there were things like World Central Kitchen, individual volunteers. They were at least through the early months really fueling the whole operation. Um, uh, you know, I would set up a tent, but it would be like local NGOs that would man it and, and probably, and they would have then often kind of huddle back in this back alley place that was far away from there because it was warm. But, uh, you know, I don't want to say, you know, like, there were people that did great work there, but at, if you ask the volunteers that were there on a daily basis, they would say most of the load was carried by people that were doing it kind of on their own pocket or the smaller NGOs. Um, Probably the biggest incident, and, and again, they would have pamphlets, but I would ask them for pamphlets, and sometimes I would have to go back 10 minutes to go find the anti-trafficking pamphlets that they had out there. But later, again, it got better over time. But one in particular incident um, rubbed a lot of them the wrong way, which was that Siobhan's Trust was like kind of like a junior World Central Kitchen. Um, they were, um, they made pizzas, they were from Scotland. And they set up in that area where people were literally dropping from, from exhaustion, where they were waiting 24, 48 hours. They set up this massive thing, making pizzas, providing tents, providing cover. They wake up one morning. This is from a former British Foreign Service officer. Um, you know, that's the pizzas. And all their tents are wiped out. It's like cold rain. It's devastated. Um, they have no idea what happened. And in the place is a massive UNHCR tent. Um, and they don't know why. And I, and I think, you know, these are some of the exchanges about it and what happened. But, um, you know, so then they started just setting up in the mud and trying to help people eventually. The, the thing that I think they were most upset about was that after they set up that tent, nobody came to staff it. So, and to get these things through, because they couldn't drive a car, they had literally been shoving stuff through in, in shopping carts across the border to set up their tent. So they did that again and they set up operations in there. And while it's, it may just be timing, there was a, around the time, about a week before, there was a big rumor that Angelina Jolie was supposed to come. So I don't know if it, we don't know for sure if it was set up because of that event, but it showed, it, it, it played into the, a lot of the concerns about the people on the ground, that it was more about show and fundraising than, than doing things on the ground. 
Um, eventually, Angelina Jolie never came to that area. She went to a different area. Ben Stiller did come to the Tesco, which is the big reception point. Um, and, uh, and again, I think he had some positive impact. One of the things that they also complained about, though, was that they, they had requested privacy shields for the, for, the, the volunt- for the refugees that didn't want to be on film. Those were never delivered beforehand either. But so there's, so you, there's just been some tension, as you can imagine, between that and overall. And it's part of a bigger picture where um, a lot of these challenges, I think, you know, I, when you look at the people that were managing this, a lot of them have incredible hearts. Uh, you can't say the Polish people have, have done more in terms of how much they've given to this. But when you go to these difficult issues, it just becomes, you know, who's taking charge of it, who's actually doing the things that are needed to do. Um, this is an example that kind of shows the example and somewhat of what seems to be the denial of these issues. Um, the UN Hotel, there was actually a, a, a story about, and this is in the Times of London, uh, individual in a Tesla had two women that he was reportedly trying to traffic and it stopped at the UN's main headquarters hotel to, uh, to recharge his vehicle. And they had run off to the spa director at the hotel and escaped. And that was in the Times of London. I attended the meeting with some of, my, some of the people at the Blue Diamond Spa where it is at the big uh, military confab. And I said, we've got this report. We've seen a lot of this going on. Um, you know, is there someone we can talk to or coordinate with this and provide this information? And a lot of the people just kind of stared and looked at their feet the UN said, hey, we will have a bilateral with you. Um, so we met with the UN afterwards and they said, well, the police have said there's no problems. It's just children getting lost from their mothers when they go to the bathroom, but everything's fine. Um, but, and that was like in the official report. But on the other hand, we had a lot of people on the ground swarm us and come up to us and say, we've seen this over and over and over again. A matter of fact, regarding the Tesla traffickers specifically, a UN official came and said, I stay at that hotel. I had seen an individual that meets a lot of the same descriptions there. He so disturbed me, bragging that he was loading up his Tesla and using it to get kids to come in and then driving them across the border that I filmed him. And so she shared the film of this guy. And she said she reported it to police, reported to all these people, said they couldn't do anything about it. Um, I then saw a Tesla matching its description going backward, back and forth a bit. Um, and again, you'd see the, the other G-Wagons, the, the Land Rovers, the other things uh, luring people at the side. And so you had the UN on the ground saying, there's nothing we can do. You had their staffers below telling us, giving us evidence. And you had the, the top line um, UN officials saying this is risk of crisis. But somewhere between the cracks, you know, when I would go to people at these babies, they said, well, it's not my responsibility. It's somebody else's responsibility. I may be the aid official that's on the ground, but I'm going on vacation next week to so talk to this guy. It, it, it's, it's, and you can understand in some ways because it's very hard and difficult, but difficult to deal with, but it's troubling. So we'll just quickly, a year of war, you know, most of the focus is, as Ambassador Joyce, I mentioned, has been on what's going on in the military strikes there, um, a, a, a getting equipment to, hand, to hold or gain physical terrain. Um, you've seen the Polish border has really been the lifeline, as we talked about. You know, from Gdansk, all the materials being able to come in to support the war, support the refugees. Um, the U.S. doubling down uh, with they're looking at again, establishing one permanent base and putting more on the border, maybe for another one. International support has been incredible with, with uh, President Zelensky. The you know the unprecedented uh, things he did for Congress, going to the British uh, with a with a military with an aircraft helmet, um, going to the EU. Uh, Poland in between, and obviously President Biden's historic trip that he made just days ago. So you can see this international support, especially from the United States. These are some numbers that go, that show the, the uh, large amount that the United States has given. This is a, a report that gets some of it wrong. Some of it is maybe o- misrepresented in terms of percentage of GDP, but you can see that how it's becoming a political issue. What you've seen with Republican presidential candidates and others starting to waver on what we're going to do going forward, um, including, um, you know, Pew Research Center did a, did a view of this. And again, you could see it break down by party, um, where people are leaning over time. Um, I don't want to go through that forever, but I want to make sure. Now you've had a change over in the House of Representatives. You've got a presidential campaign coming up, and you've had many of Trump's most loyal supporters calling for an immediate halt. So you're seeing these, I don't want to, I can't characterize how far this has gone, 
but you're seeing a real risk of, of what kind of backlash could happen at different points in time and where it would go. Again, as there's a new offensive that could drive more. And this is where I would say, we spent a lot of time looking at the, the, uh, the war effort, but even that is largely often driven by human terrain and how many soldiers are mobilizing the 500,000 that, um, that Putin is mobilizing, the, the valor of the Ukrainian soldiers. Um, but I'd also say it's in its refugees and the people are gonna have to rebuild it afterwards. Um, again, we showed you know, the, the main area where it's going through. Um, these are the, the main, the Tesco Shemish was the main reception point at the major border crossing point of the war. And then we could spend like a whole you know, days on that. But when it first got there, it sprung out of nowhere and you can't see it all the way in the background, but this is just piles of people coming there, mass chaos, um, people deployed to, to help with that. Now, um, from about two weeks ago, it's very empty. Obviously that's somewhat driven or in large part driven by the numbers that produced, but they've also changed some policies where you can only be there 48 hours and you can't go there twice. So, so even the centralized areas are now being pushed out to more dispersed areas. And you're also seeing the people that are coming now tend to be more desperate because of the people that either held on for the longest or ran out of other options in terms of what they could do. Um, this is the area, this is the new areas they're looking at. Um, this is one that was kind of formulated um, by some kind of people that got pushed out of the Tesco when the, when the uh, Polish Red Cross took it over. This is one with Sean Penn's organization and Polish Red Cross. Again, much smaller than the Tesco, but then dispersed about where they would go afterwards. Um, Shijeni, this is the main Ukraine exit. Um, back then, massive lines of cars and trucks going out, massive lines of people that I couldn't even capture on one thing. You had that a huge tent, tent that was set up and a huge amount of capability to, to service people when they were there, including a, a new NGO that was formed to kind of help them out. Now, again, it's much quieter. That's that NGO again. It's now completely empty aside from just a couple of different um, containers that they've set up on the side. Now, again, maybe the need is gone now, but if there's another rush, would they be ready to address what happens is a big question, especially as, as they've kind of ramped down. Um, the Legion recruiting force, you probably remember that from early on, um, which was kind of a, uh, you know, a chaotic site, but there was a lot of activity. Now it looks a lot more, structured and set up, but you don't have the same flow of people rushing to join the fight at this time as that has died down. Um, so that's what's left there. Um, Medica, um, again, at the first point, you saw this carnival atmosphere. You saw this chaos, craziness, hope, and, and also concerns. Now it's a ghost town. And a ghost town in terms of people you see there, there's really two main entities there now. Um, in the day, but then you also see at night, you see women and women and children coming back and forth, and there's almost zero police presence. When I was there, I went there two nights to do an overview on it and ran the same test we did. I, we couldn't find a single police officer. We did see, but we saw again, you could just walk off site indefinitely um, and, and walk off, drive to Europe any way you wanted. We did see a number of men, you know, middle-aged men uh, kind of milling around. We saw vans that fit the description we'd seen before. And when we would go in the back alleys to follow the vans, they would move. So it didn't seem like they were, wanted anyone near them. Um, and again, this is stuff we fly. So a year of war, you know, again, we, we, you've seen all these reports that you hear on the ground and all we can do is collect the data on the ground from what we've heard, but then you're hearing, kind of a dissonance in, in what you're hearing about this issue after the first couple of months. Um, these are just some statistics that I, that I found really striking. Total number of border crossings, we talked about that, it's almost like, it's almost at 10 million now. Um, even if you just look at the number of refugees remaining in Ukraine, you're at five, uh, 1.5 million. How many human trafficking active cases do you think there were as of November in Poland? Anyone wanna take a guess? You're right. Um, and that's reported by the UN. Um, how, and, and even the, the, you look at the number of estimated victims, it's slightly higher. It's like, I think it's 94. But again, if, if that's accurate, that is the most miraculous effort against human trafficking and risk that I think we've ever seen in history. Um, and I hope that that is true. Um, and we've heard reports that, you know, because of the visa free flow or because of, um, 
some people that I, I, some people in uh, some of the officials said, well, there's secret police that are on the trains that stop human trafficking. And if that's true, we should really be studying this because this would be a phenomenal effort in the face of everything that they've done. Um, but the, uh, and again, this is like the UN report kind of flags this too. It says, um, you know, on the one, um, you know, it says uh, a dramatic increase in the detections of traffic cases of human trafficking has not been recorded. And it says either this is because the authorities have a concern not acting on them, or there's some amazing thing that has caused that to go down because it's actually lower than it was last year before the war went out in many metrics. Um, but the big concern is, um, you know, the old story of a tree falls in a forest and nobody's there to see it or nobody reports it doesn't really happen. And even in talking to the lead UN author of that report, she's like, these metrics wouldn't catch her any of the things. I was hoping that there would be at least passport data. So you can look at the, data, the people that came across and then how many were there. But because of that visa free entry, they said a lot of times they're just guessing. They're just letting people go through. Um, and, there's, and if there's not the police that we verified we did not see are people there, they're, they're letting them register once they go on. And they're pushing them off often to drivers that aren't vetted, aren't tested to go anywhere in Europe and hoping that they get registered on the other side. So it's this zone that we have no idea of what happens, um, at least from the data um, and, and from what we've heard from them. So, uh, so that's, that's one of the concerns, but we have seen again, We've seen these cases, you know, what have you seen that you can see? We've seen those out there. And if you think that that ended, um, just when I went back, uh, this was a whole nother documented case that stretched at least from May until August. And this individual was posing as a doctor from Germany at the main reception area for uh, refugees. He was doing uh, private exams on girl refugees there for that period of time. He was treating people that may have contributed to their deaths, even though he had no medical certification. He had a van that he had stuck crosses on the side, claiming it to be an ambulance. And he was only, he was, he, he, well, despite all these suspicious things, he was not found out until he decided to take some money that he had collected to get a woman and her disabled daughter to Germany and disappeared before the ambulance showed up and drove off. He was actually staying at the embassy where the US had set up its consulate, uh, the, uh, or the, uh, the hotel where they were set up up in, you know, at the early stages of the war. So, and, and I could go over, there's a, there's a bunch of other stories too. I mean, I could go, some of these I mentioned, a post by an investigative journalist about exploring some of the more recent ones. So I'm not gonna go in details about those or we're holding some of the, the data on those. But again, if you see these individuals, it's kind of like the old saying, like you, you see like structural weakness in your house and you may, look at it closely and you see a couple termites, right? But it usually doesn't mean those are the only termites. You can see. And the people that we saw, you know, from doing organized crime for many years, these aren't professionals. These are disturbed lone wolf guys that were bragging about it on Facebook, on Instagram, trying to get, you know, get attention for the things that they were doing. If you're not catching those guys and those guys are walking off, What's happening with the guys that work for the multi-hundred million dollar trafficking organizations that are, you know, well-oiled machines, you know, and we're not even catching the guys that are the lone wolves. All those guys in every case, the worst thing that I heard that happened to any of them was the British guy when he went back had, had his passport taken. Although we have other people reporting they had multiple passports. So of the different jurisdictions. Anyway, again, the most disturbing case that we heard, um, and again, I can't say much about this one, but this happened in the fall and it was at the, a major border crossing and involved people that were officials, including ex Ukrainian refugees that went to help. They found a woman who was in her underwear, bloody in the back, back area where the international organization operated. Um, they called the police, they called an ambulance. The police then after the ambulance looked at her briefly, started to charge the international officials with false statements because they said the woman was fine. And at that point, they called another refugee who's a human rights attorney trained in the UK who went to the site and saw the woman, you know, talk to her. She said, well, I can help you. And she says, they won't let me help you or they won't let you. And they said, all you can do is give me money for a hotel. And then when they pay me, I, I will give you the money back. No, 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 I can, I can help you and take you somewhere. I can't, I can't give you money, but that's all I can do. 
And, and at some point she said, no, I, I can't. They, they won't let me do, never said who they were. She then turned and if you saw where the guy in the bunny suit ran out, ran out into the town. Um, none of the international officials could go for them because the, the police officers had their IDs. And the international organization officials were actually shaking and one of them was said almost had a mental breakdown because it was just painful. They then filed reports with the international organization and from the people that we know that have dealt with it, but they don't know what happened after that. So that raises questions again, how much is getting reported, how much is going up the chain and even the UN, oh, even, I'm sorry, even the UN that is, that is did the report saying that we haven't seen these signs, say they expect a spike in 2023, maybe to cover, you know, that they know things may be problematic, but even that's based on data analysis. They're looking at what happened in 2014 and 2015 with earlier crises, where is what we're talking about here, at least from my observations on the ground and others is an order of magnitude different. So the real risk is if there's not some way that, that this happened, are we, and again, I hope this is all wrong. I hope that there is, some secret program or some way that they've limited this or that we've gotten we've got we've gotten lucky through this so far but you know you say if you've seen this movie before one of the reasons i think that i was aware of this is that my own bureau inl in the state department before i got there was involved in a major human trafficking um incident that was rachel wise did a movie on it it actually involved police officers that were hired by the united states to go to uh to the former yugoslavia and uh, and UN officials were involved as well, and uh, it was again very hard to root that out. It was de denial for a long time. It, it endured. Other cases where you see where these issues, where things that are seen as entities for good, it's hard to get information about them. Obviously, the, you know the the, the human tra or the uh, abuse scandals in the Catholic Church that took years of people denying of things going on. And when people have a vested interest in something, even in like. You know, you can talk about other cases where there's powerful people and a powerful narrative of things, you know, things for, for profit, what's going on. It's, it's hard to get these people to, uh, to be held accountable or to have people even step forward when you think about the horrible situation people have gone through. Uh, and, and in some ways, that whole argument's moot because it's not even really about, you know, holding the officials accountable that, that may not have done something now. It's like, why are you not providing the basic security now? You can, you can let that slide, but, you know, it's almost the situation if you're driving your kids in a, the wrong way on a highway with drunk drivers swerving all around you, do you wait till something happens before you put on the seatbelt? So I think it's a harder case of why have they not put the basic security provisions that would be needed at some of these border crossings at this point? Um, but to, to the credit, you know, we, we've spoken recently to the embassy and other people that really seem to be taking this seriously, and that a lot of this information, again, possibly because it's not going up the chain from the law enforcement on the ground to the people on the ground, hadn't been getting up to that point. So just in closing, um, and I know I've gone on way too long, does anyone know who said what that is a quote from? Any of our Ukraine scholars, or when they said that? Uh, back in 1862. It's from a Ukrainian poet who I'm going to butcher the name, Pablo Chavinsky, and it's the first line of the Ukrainian national anthem. Um, but I think what this hits on is that Ukraine, for all of its struggles over the years, whether it was the Russians or the Germans or the Grand Duchy of Lithuania or, you know, elements of the Roman Empire, they, the people have endured and they have built Ukraine to what it was today and what inspired everything that we, we've had here inspired the world. But I think we're at a point where because of their efforts and the global efforts, we, we, no one is just counting on Ukraine not to perish, but to really defeat Russia and to, to win in this battle. It, it doesn't need to just stagger out as a basket case. It needs to be in a situation where it's thriving and where its people are protected. And again, as we, we focus, it's easy to focus on the devastation that captures headlines of the geographic terrain. But you see the, the human terrain, the women and children, they're going to be as, as essential for building Ukraine in the future. And they're not, in my view, as easy to rebuild as what you see devastated by the bombs in that situation. Um, so winning this war today and winning the peace tomorrow turns on this critical resource of Ukrainian people. And I would say that front is also in our borders. It's not just on the eastern border with Russia. It's in the west. It's here. It's what we can do to aid and make sure they're secure 
so that when this war ends, Ukraine is going to be seen as victorious, not as destroyed by Russia by other means. Um, so that's that's kind of the main thing. And I can talk through all the specific aspects, you know, the policy recommendations the report's going to have. But but that's the overview of kind of the motivation of things that that are out there. And and again, I can't thank the only way we were able to get a lot of this information was people on the ground in Poland, um, people that volunteered these things, people that spoke out a lot of times against interest and were willing to go on record or go in, in extensive interviews. Um, and all the SICE team and the students here that are that were so essential in making it come forward in Cinnamon as well. So, uh, and Jenny, I forgot to mention Jenny. Jenny has been the rock star that's, that's, that's been Jenny Roselle who's, uh, who's held this all together through all of our own challenges. So, so thank you guys for everything. And again, that's the last plea is to, to not forget the, the humans that are involved in this and what we need to do to protect them to go forward as well. Thank you. Now, any questions? Sorry. Oh wow! Um, I had some refugees incoming that. Um, oh wow! Cross. Yeah, I have to ask that. Your experience, or did you experience some gender-based violence from pro-Russian activists, pro-Putin, oh sorry, uh, pro-Putin activists um, at place on the borders uh, among the volunteers because it emerged as one of the main security cons uh, concern in, in Prague at the central station, that some of the volunteers were actually linked to pro-Russian Putin supporting groups uh, and were asking refugees, for instance, about where they're from, exactly where they're from, what is the situation there, yeah. what, you know, issues they encounter on their way uh, throughout, you know, Ukraine, whether where they saw some yeah. army, uh, you know, groups and where they are located and so on, these detailed information. Yeah. So that I wanted to ask, like, have you experienced something like that? And how, you know, what what is the extent of this I, issue? I, I can't, I um, thank you very much. And I can't verify because of, you know, intelligence concerns when people are, are turned over to things, what's happened. But there were a number of reports of similar things like this too, especially in those early days when it was complete chaos. You know, the ones that, particularly the ones, the ones that were called the cowboys, like the people that were going there to fight. There was one individual in particular that um, claimed to be a Dutch special forces guy. And there were some people interviewing these Dutch special forces counterterrorism expert who said that he went to go volunteer with the Legion and was spinning all these wild stories about how the Legion was using him as a cannon fodder and, and, uh, and the breakdowns. And then we were approached by someone else saying that that person was identified as a Russian spy. Now, can I say that 100%? I'm not, you know, I used to be a security official where, you know, I had TSSCI and all that. I don't know, you know, I don't know what happened at those point in times, but you would hear a lot of those stories kicking around. And I can say at least unless there is some covert program that I don't know about. And in some ways, I actually hoped there was one because that might explain why, you know, a better effort against uh, some of the elements that were trying to target the, the most vulnerable individuals. Um, it, uh, it would have been a, a, an open door for many people to engage in that unless you had kind of human intelligence or signal intelligence telling you who that was. Because again, people weren't even vetted for basic things like whether they were convicted for uh, sexual crimes or other things when they went there. So it, it was it was one of the, again, it, in some ways, the most uplifting in the sense that you saw one, one of the refugee or one of the volunteers said it best that these bring out the best in humanity and the worst in humanity. You see people that were giving up all their resources coming out to help people. And then you see some of the worst of humanity that are attracted to that, like moths to a flame in terms of trying to trying to take advantage of that situation. So it's a very, very dangerous situation. That's that's why the first overall recommendation, I want to go into recommendations, you have to have authority, accountability, and responsibility. You have to have people that are that have responsibility for the whole area that can can be held accountable if something breaks down and can take steps to do it. If everyone points at everyone else, the really hard things just go through the door. Yes, sir. So you did so much work that seemed like <clears throat> investigatory 
journalism. Mm. So why hasn't um, the international news media picked up this story and put it on 60 Minutes or CNN or that, that, that's maybe it. even Fox? Well, we're, it's, it's funny you should say that, that we're talking to some people about that now. What uh, One of the tricky parts about this, and I think in some of those past scandals that you've seen, is that people just go to the border instant, instantly. And especially when you're told by all the senior officials who have a vested interest to say everything is going perfectly. They don't want to say that, you know, the war is going, you know, that there's any downside, that, um, that you know, anything that would weaken support for it, for aid, for things of that nature. The top line stories, and you can read this in the New York Times last week, is that Poland is this humanitarian superpower and they're doing, and they are doing an incredible amount. But it's so, so stepping on that narrative is tricky. But just to show you how easily the press can be misled. Um, remember the person, the bunny that I told you about, the one that dressed up as a bunny that was convicted for threatening to kill children, his child. Um, so we get back and you know we did the initial Google. I won't say the name of the person, but it's a major MSNBC journalist. And this is on tape and we've recorded it. She did a series called The Best of Humanity for her, her, uh, her uh, trip that she went with her, one of her son or their son to the border. And she named like two organizations, but the very first person she named was like, look at this guy, guy's attorney from Kentucky. He's dressed as a bunny and he's out there helping people. He's one of the best of humanity. And, and so, so the media is really at a struggle here. And even, even like I said, senior officials are because so few of them are actually on the border and actually see what's happening. And we've seen this, whether it was in the Iraq war, whether it was in Afghanistan, I saw this personally, I oversaw a lot of the Afghan security is that the embassy officials are huddled in the, in the embassy compound and barely allowed to leave by diplomatic security. Um, the people that actually saw things were a lot of the security contractors or people that were unable to go in the field, but that's gotten less and less and less. So that's where I think you see this disparity between all these massive reports that we collected on the ground from people that were actually there day to day, and then the people you know, two, three hours away um, saying, oh, well, we're, we're told the police say it's not a problem or not. And, and in some ways, you can sympathize with some of the police. I mean, it, because, I mean, these guys are, you know, again, a lot of my old job, you deal with, uh, you know, drug traffickers or, or, you know, others that were, you know, unsavory elements too. But when you've got people that are willing to do these things to humans and the most vulnerable, um, they're nasty characters. And, and you know, is, is someone going to be willing to, to stick their, you know, their neck out to do that? Or is it easier for them to, to look the other way? That's, that's what, something everybody has to ask. But if you don't, especially if you don't have the infrastructure to support them and back them up on the ground, it's, it's a tough challenge. And that's why this has always been a tough challenge. That's why you saw that even in those things in the United States and elsewhere, it's really hard to deal with. All the way in the back. Thank you. My, my name is Daniel Morrow. I am from the USC Teleforum. First of all, my compliments for what oh, you are doing. Well, thank you. Uh, I would say in Italy, mm -hmm. as far as I know, the situation is not so bad mm -hmm. in Italy. Why? Mm -hmm. There is a big difference. Ukrainian women were historically, at least since 30 years working in our families, taking mm. care of our mothers. So when the refugees last year, about 70,000, were mainly women, Ukrainian with mm -hmm. kids, came to Italy, they found a social network helping mm. there. If you go on the internet, you see that the elementary school, the day after the arrival, the kids uh, were welcomed by the Italian kids. Mm. So the integration, my point is, if the society is ready to help, uh, these kind of horrible crimes will be cut off uh, in a very, uh, yeah, thank you again. <laughs> no, no, and I don't want, want to say, I, I can't I can't say to the exact situation in Italy because I wasn't on the ground there, but I heard many stories of Ukrainian refugees that match exactly what you said in that there were whole towns that would the women would go to serve as like um, a help and support for Italian towns. So there were those ties and connections. And that's one big question with 
whether this was a mistake, uh, mistakes that may have been happening. Again, these are lessons learned. I mean, I don't want to be too critical when people have done incredible amounts, you know, governments have done incredible amounts, but when there are these gaps that happen, for example, the, the, the real policy on the Polish border when people came over was because in, in the, the prime minister had actually said this because of the horrific World War II Holocaust record. They said they did not want Polish camps. So they did not want to build anything that could be turned to Polish camp where people were all in one place. So the flip side of that is they pushed everybody out as fast as they could. Process, process. Somebody has a cardboard sign, says I'm going to Germany. Somebody has a cardboard sign, I'm going to the Netherlands. Okay, take them. You know, and that's what happened early on. And because of that, because there wasn't these communities and because there wasn't a secure perimeter and there wasn't, did you open up this feeding frenzy of risk? And that's, that's something I think we're gonna have to think about going further. There's a, there's a guy that's a Ukrainian American had a really interesting idea based on, you know, some of the things that I had seen from my old State Department days about maybe you could even build like like in Afghanistan or other places where we're building schools, you can build these container, fairly nice towns and facilities. Could you build like a community for the Ukrainian people so they could stay together from the towns and then actually move them back outside of their old towns once the stability comes? But this throwing people, you know, scattering people out is very dangerous. And, and some of the other things we talk about is, can you have a centralized registration, a, you know, a global health, health number, something you know that's run by the UN, a global vetting system for, 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 in, for volunteers. I mean, some of this stuff would seem to be very, very basic. And they've got things like, um, like uh, Restoring Family Links is a Red Cross program, but it was so old and outdated. The woman that ran it was a friend of mine who helped me out. But she set up a, a, a desk. She literally had to go out or buy her own desk in Tesco. And again, this is the major reception point at the major border crossing of the entire war. Bought her own thing bought her own forms, print them out. The Red Cross officials uh, reportedly, according to her, came in from, from the main office and said, these are all the wrong forms. We have to throw them all out. And you can imagine where somebody's like sitting there for weeks doing that stuff. So why there's with all the money going into this, there can't be more efforts to, to be better prepared for the future is, is something we hope comes out of. But I, I agree with you from what I've heard is there's a st strong network in Italy of people and that community can make all the difference in terms of protecting people too. Right there. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation right. today and for the great work you did documenting you. The, the cases. Um, I have two questions, sure. if that's all right. Um, my first question is, um, around this great documentation uh, that you've done and the link to the two active cases uh, right. going on. Um, right. If you can help me connect the dots there. Right. Um, and my second question is around the authority, accountability and responsibility that you mentioned. And if you see any evolution as the crisis progressed. Right. Um, so over the summer, I was volunteering at the Hrebenne oh, Crossing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so there, you know, I saw um, representatives from the municipal government, mm -hmm. the local government, yep. dedicated to observing for human trafficking cases. Yeah, yeah. I think you may argue how effective right, uh, right. They, they can be, um, but they definitely did not lack dedication. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. You know, the anecdote I have is right. woman staying over my whole night shift and then later because she That's knew there was a bus with from orphanage coming across. Um, and so if you can speak how yeah. that evolves over time. Th th those are those are two incredibly important points, and let me take let me take the second one first. Um, that it was the, the whole point of this was that it was farmed out to the local area, like in Shemish and Medica. It was those mayors that were in charge of that. If the mayors were great, they may have been able to try to you know they had to reinvent the wheel. They a lot of times they had to figure it out on their own. So some did a very good job. And again, some of the ones in the northernmost points I thought were, looked incredibly efficient. Again, I, I can't say that I looked at them as in depth as I did at Medica, but they looked far more well run. And there are other ones where people, again, I don't think anybody who was doing this that I encountered from the government was actively saying we want this to happen. It was that they were so overwhelmed and they had no resources. So the question is, well, why, why couldn't there have been officials to help that mayor do that so she's not or she or he is not sitting there all night on their own not knowing how to and again these are these are nasty characters and sophisticated characters at the high end um 
So why, you know, how were they, you know, part of the story is that they were left without the support. They were left without this backbone. And, and some of them did the, very well with the best they could. Some of them just got overwhelmed and exhausted and gave up. I, it, it, it's different stories on different places. And it's funny because one of the ones at the northernmost um, point by Belarus, I was interviewing the people and they were, again, incredibly nice people doing an doing a incredible amount. But one of my friends is Polish because he was listening to the recordings that I made. He goes, yeah, well, they basically admit that they had no idea what they were doing. They're just trying to figure it out on their own because because they were. And again, they're, they should get all the credit in the world for that. Really, the people that I think, if you, again, it's, for me, it's not... It's, it's, it's less about responsibility because in some way, you know, ultimately you can look at that, but right now the, the most urgent thing is stopping more people from being exposed to this and trying to help as many people in the past. Because I think one of the reasons we've gotten to this is in these passages, if you overlook something or shove it behind and it gets worse and worse and worse, it gets harder to admit both psychologically and, 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 uh, and, and accountability wise that you didn't address it earlier. So almost addressing it now is an admission that you were the person before you did wrong. The, the, the big disparity is, again, that was the number is that number comes from the UN reports and it's what Poland reported to the UN. But it, it, it matches a lot of the other stats that just dropped my draw, you know, dropped my jaw dropped on the ground when I heard it. Like, for example, when I when I went to that UN meeting and the UN person came to me and I was like, your own hotel had a trafficking incident last weekend. This is documented in a UK paper. You, one of your own officials ran up to me and brought me a video of someone at that same store that she's concerned about. And you're saying there's no problem. I, I mean, the dissonance between that is what scares me the most is that, um, you know, that I assumed, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't what I wanted to focus on. You know, when I went out there, I had hoped to focus on, you know, all the amazing things the NGOs are doing, which is great, how we can mobilize that, how we can coordinate that. And I think there is a big story on that front too, but you need that basic leadership and security to make that possible. And if you don't, it's an Achilles heel and it can undermine everything else that you've done. And if there's not that recognition, then, then it, it does it cause more harm than good. You have to, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough balance. You have another question, Julie? Any investor? Oh, oh, okay. Well, well, okay. No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so sure. I'm wondering about the Ukraine side of this. So right. Women and children moving east. Yeah. So was there some kind of organization that encouraged the men to stay and the women to go and guidelines or? Yeah, that's, recommendations it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's funny when, when I, I've got a picture of myself right where that boy, it's not there anymore. But when you when you're coming at Shijani, which is my Ukrainian is worse than my Polish, but um, it's, it's spelled S-H-E-H-Y-N-I. There's a big border sign that was kind of like the, the Ukrainians told me it's like stay and fight for Ukraine. So they were actively preventing the men from leaving. Um, and, and that and that was what, what you know, encouraged both a lot of them to, you know, to stay and double down and fight, you know, even the ones, you know, but they showed such valor across the board any, in any event, but it did create the situation where the women and children and the disabled really had, you know, were, were going in a situation where a lot of times they didn't have the normal kind of levels of protection or community that they might have. So, and uh, do you, uh, you want to grab a couple of the questions? Yeah, um, sure. thank you to those listening in on the Zoom chat. We have a few questions and some great feedback from our listeners. Sure. Um, the first being from Piotr, who's um, from the Global Gambit. Right, He's uh, Piotr's been great. He helped, he helped uh, actually, he did a, a very emotional, um, after my first stint, I did uh, one of his Global Gambits from a hotel room as I was flying out. And, that, and I, it was emotional, but I was also, again, hopeful, you know, which the saddest part was doing going on again and saying, like you said, there were lessons learned and places did improve. Things got better and things got worse, but there hasn't been the systemic lessons learned to go forward. So I don't want to say everything's gotten worse. Some things have gotten better. Sorry, I'm sorry to go. No, no worries. Um, thank you. His question, um, he wanted to ask a question on the varied treatment amongst different refugees. At the beginning of the war, there was a lot of confusion and frustration over the disproportionate treatment of non-white and non-European refugees versus others from, for instance, India or African countries who were there perhaps studying. How has this changed? Has there been any improvement or better coordination to track or monitor this that you've seen? 
or um, any setup of groups of representatives to help people who need a point of contact? Yeah, no, I think this is a very big issue. And it's one that I have not looked at in depth, but I heard a lot from people that were doing this, especially compared to the refugees that came in from, from, from Syria and from other areas. And that the, the huge contrast, again, I have not studied this in depth, so I can't, I can't make a, a statement, but I can say there was a huge sentiment among the people and the volunteers, including those from Poland around the world, that there was a, a dramatically different treatment between that case and this case. And I think that was some of that was touched on in the New York Times Magazine as well. There's also been another development and I'm going to, I'm probably going to mispronounce this again. It's called the Magur, and sometimes they are referred to as the Roma people that are a subset of the Roma people that actually live in Ukraine. Um, but, but you, that, you know, that have, that are somewhat migratory, but the Magur, I believe, live primarily in Ukraine or a big, or a big proportion of them do. They came into some of the refugee centers. And again, this is based on reports that I have not had extensively enough. So it's more anecdotal than some of the other things like I can tell you all the people that told me they saw vans at Medica, and I have that both things that I've seen and things that I can document. This um, is more sparse, but it is. But they've said that there was real issues when those individuals started coming to the refugee groups versus the people that you had seen as stereotypical Ukrainian, and that that caused a lot of tension over the um, all over the resources and what was being done and may have led to some of the policy changes, again, keeping people for 48 hours or, or not allowing them to come back again. Um, and there were some, so, so yeah, I, again, it's not something I can speak about more than anecdotally, but I did hear some things that, that definitely went along with those lines. Thank you. And one more question from Paul, who I believe, um, based on his comment, um, may have been at the border as well. Oh, wow. He cites, um, you know, the hideous criminals who had volunteered there. That he, he saw them all. Yeah. Um, so you may have touched upon this earlier, but do you think there is um, an ability of an NGO to share the names of volunteers for, with global law enforcement checks or something similar? Can this ever become a reality? I think it should. I mean, I think there should be a, you know, again, this would be one of the recommendations is that there should be a secure area for NGOs to share this information and for individuals. But I tell you right now, people are scared. People that experience this feel threatened. I mean, the one case the study I talked about, they were threatening to, to, to actually prosecute the people for false statement for just saying that they found a woman in this dire situation. And these were UN, these were senior international organization officials um, that were trained for this. So I can tell you how many people said, if we keep raising this, they're not gonna let us stay here. Or, and, and that goes to the whole issue of why is none of this getting reported up? Why, is, why are people not hearing this? If it's that easy to scare people so that they don't report it, again, it's the tree that falls in a forest that nobody ever saw. Because, because they can just say, we got a perfect score. There's no human trafficking cases because they were never reported. Or we're down to two cases going you know, this year. I, again, I hope that there was some, some incredible thing that caused that to happen. But I think just, just hoping that that's the case is, is not a substitute for at least providing basic security going forward. Um, Stephen, thank you so thank you. much for um, the good answers to the questions for a really interesting presentation. Yeah. Right. You've hinted at one of the recommendations, sure. so um, responsibility, authority, yeah. and accountability. And so I'm wondering if you would summarize for us um, some of the other recommendations sure. that you're going to include there. Please. Great, great. Yeah, no, and I think there's, the, I we kind of put them in three buckets, and one of them is, um, you know, and I've, and I've talked to some, is about how it's securing a safe passage and lifeline. And again, it may be too much to go all the border crossings at once, but we know that the, the Shigeni, Medica, Shemesh is the main border crossing for foot traffic of this war. So if you could have that where you had people on the ground that both you know, knew about all, you know, could speak Ukrainian, could speak um, you know, Polish, uh, English, any of the, you know, they're at the two ends of the border crossing, giving people advice officially, not random people that can intervene in them and, and promise them the room or promise them they're taking them to a villa in Europe or whatever, but can watch that along with law enforcement that can enforce that, that would go a long way to securing that area. Um, having secure perimeters around the areas um, and, and including in the, um, in the refugee centers where you had people vetted. I mean, if you had, I know CBP has a very effective vetting system, but even like Europol or Interpol, there's no reason 
you shouldn't be vetting the people that are that are dealing with the most vulnerable people here, especially when you've had story after story after story. I'm not telling you, like I told you, like the, the, the three or four, I could I could go on for a long list. The guy in a fire suit, the guy in a clown suit. Um, you know, I could just, you know, you go on and on and on and on. And, and it's like it, 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 the fact that, you know, you could say these are all anecdotal, but at what point do you you actually have to put some boots on the ground to figure out what the actual situation is. So, so those are some from there. And then the other ones, I think, where the EU and the UN could really step in is, I don't understand with all the resources why you can't, if you're not giving them a phone when they get off, I know people are giving them SIM cards, but give them a single lifeline where they can call and have a Ukrainian person that could then put match up with them in a network everywhere. Some of it is that we've got so many people helping. Like, and this has changed over time. But when I first got there, I begged the UN officials. I said, please put up a sign that says, don't, you know, watch out for traffickers and don't, you know, follow official people. And it took me a long time. They finally did that. But then, uh, you know, be careful what you ask for. When I went back another time, there were so many signs from so many different individuals that it was like about everything in the world, like food, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it was like overwhelming. And from the psychologists that I talked to, that can be as overwhelming as I did. One of the women that's just amazing woman, she's a human rights attorney, um, fled Ukraine, went back to volunteer on the border. She said uh, in, a, in, a, in a, about this case and other cases, when people come across that border, they're just, they think they're home. They think they're safe. All their guard goes down. They want to trust people and do what they want to do. And she actually said that people would come to her and she would give her them options. She said, do you want to go to this Tesco reception site? Do you want to go here? And she's like, you pick for me. I can't pick, I can't think anymore. Cause I mean, I've never been, and I don't know, many people have been through that kind of trauma and turmoil, but at that point where you're just so trusting and you get there, having people officially there is, is important. And especially when they're gonna be transported abroad or into other countries, because the fact that they still weren't vetting people after story, after story, after story, there's one that, Again, it's less documented, so I, I didn't include it in the report, but it was at, at one of the major sites where they had individuals, they lost, apparently, again, this is more anecdotal because it's from someone, but they lost two vans of women and children, and then they did an assessment of the people that were doling out the vans and found criminal connections. Accord, again, this is anecdotal, so, I can't, so I'm careful about the ones that I pick for the case studies versus the ones that I point, but at a minimum, when you've got this much smoke, Shouldn't you be looking for the fire or shouldn't you at least be putting the basic standards there so you've got that kind of security? So, so those are a lot of them I know. One, another one's were like the things about, do you, can you build communities of people so they can support each other and they're easier to protect and easier to, but there's, there's, there's a lot of different things. But, uh, but I think the basic ones, the, sad, the saddest thing is that the basic ones, even the volunteers, there's a guy that was a, a, Polish, a, a, a Polish actor in France who came back and was running the site. He knew that you had to have people vetted, that you had to have a you know, secure perimeter, that you couldn't just let people go back and forth, that you had to have monitoring. A lot of this stuff wasn't rocket science. It was just there was nobody in place, authority, accountability, and responsibility to put it in place and, and make it happen. Um, final question from the Zoom chat sure. um, from Delaney. Um, she said, I wonder if you could speak a little on distinguishing between cases of deliberate exploitation and cases of shoddy coordination. Yep. I was in Medica and Presmizel, apologies. Shemish, Shemish. Shemish. Yeah, yeah, Shemish. Okay. Yeah. I, if you look at it spelled, you can never say it correctly. <laughs> That's what I found about all these places. I, I, if I try to look at them and spell them or think about them, I, I get it wrong. So, or sure. worse than so, I normally would. Yeah, she was in uh, Medica That's and great. Shemish um, in April as media, and there were a lot of concerns over an Italian group, ROE Protezione Civil de Roma. It ultimately seemed to be a case of bad communication and gossip run amok, but it seemed like a lot of actions can fall into gray area. For example, groups like NFSC, which seem to be delivering aid inefficiently and prioritizing self-promotion over proper aid. Oh, yeah. No, this is, this is a huge question, and, and this is the exact point is we don't know because there's no structure to tell who is, you know, the good hearted Samaritan and who's not. We saw like, again, Benjamin Bunny, the convicted person for or the disbarred person for what for trying to kill trials, praised on MSNBC as the best of humanity. You, and, and it's tough for reporters because, yeah, again, our officials don't even know this because there's not people on the ground. I mean, that this is a writ large, larger thing that I would say for our 
U.S. government across the board, is we have to have more people that are willing to be on the ground in, in the rougher situations, uh, you know, and really to take those risks. Because a lot of times what they defer to now is would be the military, like they did in Afghanistan and Iraq. And and they have a skill set, but often it's not the skill set you need to to you know to build a democracy or to build um, that kind of support. But but anyway, so you know, so exactly, it's 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 a, it's hard to tell any of this. And even when I'm interviewing people, there's, for example, I won't name any names, but there is a um, a uh, something that spun off the te the Tesco, and I could, again, you could write a book on the Tesco reception center. Um, it got taken over after a lot of these problems, including that. One of the foreigners that was running it, apparently, again, to multiple reports, walked off with all the personal data of the refugees and was holding it hostage at one point in time, which is a massive, uh, again, I could go on a million different stories about these things. And this one is fairly well documented because in the, in the aftermath of that, then the Polish Red Cross took over. So this goes to show you, again, one of these stories. So there was a guy there. Um, it, it, sad case. He, was, he had lost his leg earlier for other reasons, for like inappropriate treatment. He was brought there as about 45 years old. There were Hadassah doctors there, that uh, a charity that was, that was doing you know, really helpful work there in the Tesco. And they saw, they evaluated him and said, you know, he, he's at risk of losing his other leg. So they took him to the hospital. They, uh, he had his toe amputated, but they managed to save the leg. They brought him back. And then the decision was, we're going to change this whole reception point. So we're going to kick everybody out in three days. I think it was three to four, two to three days. And so they promised the people that, especially the disabled people that were post-op were going to have, um, were going to have, uh, uh, you know, go to local places where they could treat them. But a person that was monitoring this individual found out, like got a call the next morning, the person had been put on a train to Hanover um, without any place to go. Um, and you, so you see these, so on the one side, you look at, they provided incredible care for him, you know, free surgery, free healthcare, all this stuff to this point, but then you can have these breakdowns and that's why the management of it and the oversight of it is as important as, you know, as the other things. And it's, again, it's people just get worn out and you, you, you have to have that kind of system so that people, even that are trying to do good, just don't get exhausted and make bad decisions in those kind of situations. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, Got to cut off the time. Je the boss back there, Jenny, is saying, cut it off, who, who, who's, who, 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 who controls everything. But thank you guys for everything, for paying, for listening to this. And, uh, and, any, and again, we, we'd love to have anyone help mm -hmm. that can on this. Yeah, so please join me in thanking Steve.